So only a couple of minutes is needed for this quick introduction of radio astronomy. Radio astronomy is the study of natural radio emissions from celestial sources. Because the radio window is so broad, almost all types of astronomical sources, thermal and non-thermal, as well as propagation phenomena, can be observed at radio wavelengths. Early radio astronomy was a science of discovery and serendipity. It revealed a parallel universe of unexpected sources not previously seen, or at least not recognized as being different from ordinary stars. Some important discoveries of radio astronomy include the cosmic microwave background radiation from the Big Bang, the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, as well as other radio galaxies and quasars also powered by supermassive black holes, pulsars and neutron stars, plus thermal spectral line emission from cold interstellar gas, as well as non-thermal maser emission from interstellar molecules. Nearly everything emits radio waves to some level by a wide variety of emission mechanisms. When compared to the optical astronomy, the parallel radio universe seems to be more violent. For example, compare, compare the steady light output of most visible stars to the observed energy of radio universe, which reflects high energy and explosive phenomena in radio galaxies, quasars, supernova, and, and pulsars. Also, the radio universe can be called. The cosmic microwave background radiation is at 2.7 Kelvin and dominates the electromagnetic energy in the universe while cold interstellar gases emit spectral lines at radio wavelengths. Many radio sources are powered by gravity instead of nuclear fusion, and in general, the radio universe is cosmologically distant. Most of the continuum radio sources are extragalactic, and many are seen at look-back times comparable to the age of the universe. Natural radio emission from our galaxy was detected serendipitously in 1932 by Carl Jansky, a physicist working at radio, as a radio engineer for Bell Telephone Laboratories. In the 1920s, the Bell Telephone Company offered transatlantic telephone services based on shortwave radio transmission. As a consequence, natural radio static was a serious source of interference, so Bell Lab tasked their young engineer Carl Jansky to determine its origin. Jansky proposed and built the antenna shown in the image to monitor radio static at 20.5 MHz. Its reception pattern was a fan beam that was pointed near to the horizon and could be rotated in azimuth. He found that most of the static is produced by lightning strikes in numerous tropical thunderstorms. But he also discovered a steady hiss, whose strength rose and fell daily with a period of 23 hours and 56 minutes. This he recognized to be the length of this sidereal day, and he deduced that the hiss must originate somewhere outside the solar system. The hiss also seemed to be strongest in the direction of the galactic center. Jansky actually published his results in a paper titled Electric Disturbance of Apparently Extraterrestrial Origin. But Bell Labs had no practical interest in understanding the cosmic component of radio static and reassigned Jansky to other projects. Jansky himself believed that the cosmic noise was thermal emission because it produced a steady hiss in his headphones that sounded very much like the hiss generated by hot electrons in vacuum tube amplifiers. Unfortunately, skeptical astronomers couldn't understand how such strong radio source could be produced and generally ignored it. The only person who took a serious interest in Jansky's discovery was the amateur radio operator and professional radio engineer, Grote Reber. Radio astronomy offered a new science to conquer, and soon it became his obsession. He devoted years of his life to build the world's first radio antenna using a parabolic reflector at his own expense in his backyard in Wheaton, Illinois, and using it to map the galaxy. In 1938, he finally succeeded in detecting and mapping the galaxy at 160 MHz, thereby confirming Jansky's discovery and demonstrating that the radio emission was a distinctly non-thermal spectrum. He observed only at night because automotive ignition interference was too strong during the day. He patiently recorded meter readings by hand, once per minute, and his result was actually published in the Astrophysical Journal. Then World War II intervened. 
hindering astronomical research, but stimulating progress in radio and radar technology. Some of the engineers and physicists who developed and used this technology during the war led the rapid scientific development of radio astronomy immediately afterwards. Most optically bright stars are undetectable at radio wavelength, and many strong radio sources are optically faint or invisible. While, radio, while familiar objects like the sun and planets can appear quite different when seen through the radio and optical windows. If we could see the radio sky by eye, it would look something similar to the image shown. The extended radio sources spread along a band from the lower left to the upper right all lie in the outer regions of our galaxy. Of these, the brightest irregular shaped sources are clouds of hydrogen, ionized by luminous young stars. Such stars quickly exhaust the nuclear fuel, collapse and explode into supernova. These supernova remnants appear as faint radio rings. Unlike the nearby stars visible to the human eye, almost none of the myriad radio stars scattered across the sky in the figure as we see it are actually stars. They are distant, extremely luminous radio galaxies or quasars. Radio waves travel at the speed of light. So distance, distant extragalactic sources appear to us today as they actually were billions of years ago. Radio galaxies and quasars are beacons carrying information about galaxies and their environments from everywhere in the observable universe and ever since the first galaxies were formed. The radio sky is dark even when the sun is up because atmospheric molecules and dust particles don't scatter radio waves. This is because radio wavelengths are much larger than the actual size of these particles. Most radio observations can be made day and night. Clouds are also nearly transparent at centimeter wavelengths, so long wavelength radio observations can be made when the sky is overcast. The brightest discrete source is still the sun. But the sun is much less dominant than it is in the visible light. Unlike optical astronomy, the moon and planets are not detectable because they reflect solar radiation at radio wavelength. However, they all emit thermal radiation. And Jupiter is even a strong non-thermal so source of radiation as well. If the sun were suddenly switched off, the planets would remain radio sources for a long time, slowly fading as they cooled. The cosmic static discovered by Carl Jansky is primarily diffuse emission, originating in and near the disk of our galaxy. Some of the diffuse continuum emission from our galaxy can be resolved into discrete sources, such as the supernova remnants Cas A and the Crab Nebula. These relativistic electrons diffused throughout the galaxy account for about 90% of the 1 GHz continuum emission from our galaxy. Most of the remaining continuum emission at 1 GHz is thermal emission from H2 clouds, which are hydrogen clouds ionized by UV radiation from extremely massive stars. The nearest large H2 region is actually the Orion Nebula. In fact, massive short-lived stars are responsible for nearly all of the radio continuum in our galaxy, and the radio luminosity of most spiral galaxies are proportional to their recent star formation rates. Another example of a bright radio source is 3C273, a quasar. In fact, 3C273 was identified as the first quasar. These quasars appear to be radio galaxies, powered by supermassive black holes that are especially active. Visible light from the region near the black hole overwhelms the starlight from the, from the host galaxy and make this quasar look like a very bright star. Lastly, the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is a thermal radiation from the hot Big Bang. It fills the universe and is the energetically dominant component of all electromagnetic radiation. What we actually see is the surface of the last scatter a scattering beyond which the universe was ionized and opaque. It is at such a large redshift that the photons received today were emitted when the universe was only 400,000 years old. The CMB is nearly isotropic and is very nearly a perfect black body at 2.73 Kelvin temperature. With the advent of telescopes in space, the entire electromagnetic spectrum has become accessible to astronomers. 
Many sources discovered by radio astronomers can now be studied in other wave, wave bands, and new objects such as gamma ray bursters discovered in other wave bands can now be followed up at radio wavelength. Radio astronomy is no longer a separate and distinct field. It is only one facet of multi-wavelength astronomy. Thank you.